Good afternoon. I am really pleased that we have this afternoon time together today. Uh, we are looking at our study of the Bible from beginning to end, just an overarching, overarching view of Scripture. And we're looking at um, the plot or the plan or the message of God uh, throughout Scripture that of His love for His people and His constant efforts on our behalf to draw us into Him. So our hymn is Great is Thy Faithfulness. They fail not as thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. We come to our prayer time today, and um, we have been rejoicing in Debbie's, uh, Debbie Meyer's renewed um, restoration, but recently she's had to go back into the hospital, and there are some signs of organ rejection with her lung transplant. So she's gonna be in the hospital for a couple of weeks. Everything looks like it's under control and being taken care of. But her father, Jay <clears throat> Meyer, passed away recently and his funeral is scheduled for this Saturday morning at the church at 10 o'clock and Debbie won't be able to be there. Thankfully, we are showing most of our funerals now on a uh, live stream, so she will be able to, to watch it. But please keep Debbie and her whole family in your prayers. Uh, it's, a very, it's been a very difficult time, and that difficult time is continuing. Uh, she is in our hearts and prayers. Um, let's have a word of prayer. Good morning, Father. We come to you today, your children, and we are in various states of being. Some of us are in peace and calm. Some are in joy. Some are in despair. Some are lonely. Some are hurting. We are your children, and that is life in human skin. And we are so thankful that as your children, we know that you, the sovereign of the universe, are sovereign in our lives, and that you are here with us, and that you are always, in every circumstance, working for our good. It is such an assurance for us today, Father, to know that your love always triumphs. And that as you pour your love out on us so generously, we are filled up in ways that enable us to love each other 
to notice and be sensitive to the hearts of others and the struggles of others and to be willing to stand with them as you stand with us and for us to have mercy and forgiveness as you have for us. And so with all of that being affirmed, we come to you seeking the fruits of your spirit on this congregation that we are part of. We've been through a, an arduous process, sometimes painful, sometimes full of grief and even anger and Father, what we want is your gifts. We want you to be greater and us to be less. We want your kingdom to come in us and around us and through us. And so we come kneeling at your feet, seeking your strength and your comfort and your courage and your wisdom for the days ahead. We thank you for walking with us and for continuing to walk with us. And each of us that is listening today, we bring our own heartaches and our own struggles and our own challenges and lay them before you. For we find it still increasingly difficult for us to, to manage everything in this life on our own. We require you, Father. We require your presence with us. And we also bring before you those we love who are struggling. Friends, family, neighbors, our hearts go out in so many ways. You've created tender hearts in us, Father, and we appreciate that. But as we suffer for others, we seek your help in tending to them. We bring our sister Debbie before you and her family. With her health issues continuing, we ask for her healing, and we ask for wisdom for the professionals that are dealing with her, and we ask for compassion for all those that are around her. And we also ask for strength and comfort as they are saying their final goodbyes here to her father. Be with her, and we are we are aching, Father, that we can't be with her in this time of loss. We ask that you open our hearts and minds today to the messages that we will look at in your word. Show us your ways. Show us your message, show us your plan, and then give us the strength to live into it. And we pray all of this in the name of your precious Son, Jesus. Amen. Let's read our opening. O Church of God, united to serve one common Lord, Proclaim to all one message with hearts in glad accord. Christ ever goes before us. We follow day by day with strong and eager footsteps along the upward way. Last week we looked at um, the major prophets and um, these are major prophets that were written prophets because Elijah and Elisha were both uh, major prophets, but they were all their work, 
words were oral. All their messages were oral messages. The prophetic books of the Old Testament have two functions. One, to predict something that is going to be fulfilled by God in the future. The second is to preach, which has an element of correction to it, an element of instruction to it. Um, so as we finished with the major prophets, we are going to go today real quickly through the minor um, prophets. And that designation, as I mentioned last week, has nothing to do with the merits of the books. It doesn't have to do with the importance of the message. It has to do simply with their length. And so first we're going to look quickly uh, at all of these, but Hosea is the start. And Hosea portrays the love of God through his own marital experience. God had Hosea marry an adulterous woman. And, uh, and eventually she was driven out of their home by her adulterous behavior. And, um, Hosea was encouraged by God to continue to love her and to take her back um, in, in a certain set of circumstances. Now, this relationship between Hosea and an adulterous wife was meant to, re to resemble, to symbolize Israel and Judah having rejected God, just as Hosea's wife rejected him. They had turned to idols as Hosea's wife had turned to other lovers. In Hosea 11, 1 through 2, the message says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. And God's message, he, he is, his anguish is present in this message. Um, and the message that he comes through Hosea urges the people to give up their idols. In, in Hosea 11.8, you can hear God's anguish in this question. How can I give you up, Ephraim? And Ephraim was the name for his people. Uh, how can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? God is talking about his love is so great for them that even as they rebel against him or reject him or abandon him, he can't imagine cutting them off. And he promises a way of healing. In Hosea 14, 9, he says, Who is wise? Let them realize these things. Who is discerning? Let them understand. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. And Hosea is, in general, is a, um, a proclamation of God's love and compassion. Then we come to Joel. And Joel dates his message. Sometimes they're given a date. Sometimes they're given a king. And that sort of, uh, they give a king and that sort of tells when they were uh, doing their prophecies. Uh, but Joel's, Joel dates his message by a locust invasion. And it is, for the people, this locust invasion is a time of tragedy because it wipes out their crops, but it is not without hope. Listen to Joel 2. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, 
not your garments, because sometimes when they were going through their lamentations, they would rip their garments. And he says, rip your heart open, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he resents, I'm sorry, he relents from sending calamity. We have this message that restoration and blessing will come after repentance. And this is something you're going to notice through all these minor prophets. There is a reoccurring theme of repentance leading to blessing or obedience leading to blessing and restoration uh, being possible. There's a message of judgment and a message of compassion. And it runs, it's expressed in different ways, but the meaning is the same, that this is how God's relationship with his people work. So we come to the book of Amos. And um, by trade, Amos was a herdsman, a shepherd of sorts. Uh, it does, since it says herdsman, I can't assume that it was sheep. It could have been goats. It could have been uh, cattle. Um, but he was a herdsman, and he identifies himself as a dresser of sycamore trees. Well, of course, I had to look that up um, because when I was growing up, one of my favorite trees in my yard was a sycamore tree. And I don't know how much you know about trees, but the sycamore tree is the largest deciduous tree in America. And deciduous means it loses its leaves. Um, and they have, they're a very large tree with a very large leaf on it, which my father hated raking. And they have a ball that is full of um, almost like dandelion seeds. The seeds are wispy when you break the ball open. They're wispy to be caught in the wind and, and blown uh, to be planted. That is not the sycamore tree they're talking about. Maybe you remember as a child singing, uh, Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree the Savior for to see. That's the sycamore tree we're talking about here. It is, in the, it is in the family of the fig tree. It has a fruit on it that is similar to a fig. And uh, it's, got, it's low to the ground with low branches, and that was why it was easy for um, Zacchaeus to get up in it in order to get a better view. Now, the job of the dresser of the sycamore tree, I came across two different references. One of them was that what the dresser's job was, was to where the, the fruit was growing from the tree, you know, there'd be a little stem or stalk attaching it, that they would pinch that in a way that caused the fruit to ripen more quick, quickly. Another description said they would pierce the skin of the fruit in order to ripen it more quickly. The problem being that the birds like this fruit, and if it hung around on the tree very long, the birds would destroy the crop of the figs. And so they were trying to rush the ripening of the fig. Um, and so that's how Amos identified himself as a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And he did that because he wanted it to be clear that he was outside the religious um, establishment. He did not, he wasn't the son of a prophet. He, which happened sometimes, that prophets begat prophets. But he was a common man outside the establishment of the religion who God had chosen to give a message to. He was called by God. And um, the other thing that made it a little bit awkward for him as a prophet was that he was from Judah in the southern kingdom, and God called him 
to prophesy to Israel, the northern kingdom. Well, I don't think it ever goes very well when somebody from the outside comes in to tell you what you're doing wrong or to correct you or to give you instructions. And it made it very um, awkward for Amos to go and prophesy in the Northern Kingdom. Um, and he wasn't readily accepted in the Northern Kingdom. Um, but his appeal was for true religion. Uh, from chapter 5 of Amos, we have this from God. I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are <clears throat> a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. I'm assuming that the people's religious festivals were really a mockery of worship and praise and prayer, that they were not, according to God, they were not heartfelt because we know when people approach God from their heart that he, that that is acceptable unto him and it's delightful to him. But here, all the things that they talked about doing as part of their religious practices are abhorrent to him. And that can only be because they were done without true love of the Lord. And next we come to Obadiah. And that is the shortest of all the Old Testament books. And it deals with a very specific problem, the Edomites. <clears throat> Obadiah is only one chapter, so when you see a designation like our scripture that we're going to read, it says Obadiah 10, and there's no colon there. That's because it is the 10th verse, and there's only one chapter there. So, uh, and there's 21 verses in this chapter of Obadiah. Now let's look at our maps, and there's two things that you need to notice. The map on the right, you will see the um, blue kingdom of Judah. The, there's a light green kingdom of Israel, and there's a yellow kingdom to the south of Judah that's called the kingdom of Edom. This, um, message was primarily written to, for, and about the Edomites. And they were descendants of Esau. Remember the story of the twins? And Jacob was the one that was chosen to carry the family inheritance and blessings. And he was the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. His brother Esau was the patriarch of the Edomites. And so, in a way, that these were related. The Edomites were related to the, to the Israelites, uh, sort of cousins, sort of. Um, the other map relates to Babylon, because uh, when the Babylonian Empire invaded and overthrew Israel and Judah, uh, some of the Jews that were living in, in the area, and probably most of the ones were from Judah, fled to Edom to escape the Babylonians. But the Edomites betrayed them and turned them over to the Babylonians, and that was the source of God's wrath that is dealt with in Ob Obadiah 10. We have this verse, because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame 
you will be destroyed forever. And he's talking about the Edomites. Um, and the, the part that goes unspoken there is that Israel will prosper. The next um, book is Jonah, and it is probably the best known of the minor prophets. Uh, and it's really known more for Jonah's story himself and his relationship with God than it is the message Jonah was given by God. Uh, because Jonah was given the job by God of going to Nineveh, which, he con which Jonah considered to be the enemy. And God wanted him to go and warn Nineveh that they needed to repent. And Jonah didn't want to do it because he knew if they repented that God would have compassion on them and he hated them so much he did not want them to experience God's compassion. And so he ran the other way. And we know the story of the big fish and that Jonah finally did go to Nineveh and preach the message of God. And it was well received by the Ninevites. But that only made Jonah angrier because he held it against them their wicked ways and did not want them to be forgiven by God and to live in God's grace. So the lesson that Jonah learned was that God loves even wicked people and is anxious for them to repent. And as I've said, Jonah found that hard to accept. And at the end of the book, after all of that, at the end of the book, he is still pouting about God having compassion on the Ninevites. And it ends, the book ends without any indication that Jonah himself came back into right relationship with God. And one of the reasons it's left open-ended is so that all the readers, all the hearers of this message would have to answer that sort of question for themselves. How do I respond when God is merciful to our enemy? And so it's a question we have to deal with in our own faith walk. Next we have Micah. And uh, the probability is that Micah was a farmer, a peasant farmer, and the most uh, powerful thing about Micah is um, a message about justice. Micah 2, uh, 1 through 2 says, Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light they carry it out because it is in their power to do it. They covet fields and seize them, and houses and take them. They defraud people of their homes, and they rob them of their inheritance. Much of this is uh, a reflection of people abusing their power to uh, oppress those less fortunate than themselves. Micah 3, 9 says, Hear this, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, who despise justice and distort all that is right, who built Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with wickedness. Her leaders judge for a bribe, her priests teach for a price, and her prophets tell fortunes for money. Hear all that corruption? Yet they look for the Lord's support and say, Is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come upon us. So what the Lord is seeing when he looks upon his people is those who oppress rather than love and have compassion for others, those who are corrupt and out for themselves, and yet turn all the time with a word about the Lord and expect to be protected by him. And then Micah challenges the hearers with a rhetorical question. Good for us too. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. 
And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The message in Micah, like I've mentioned before, alternates between doom and hope, between God's sternness and His kindness. And that, that type of message is present in nearly all of the Minor Prophets. The book of Nahum uh, predicts the fall of Nineveh. Uh, and it talks about how Judah can rejoice that the Assyrians will suffer for their brutality to others. That was another, uh, the Babylonians conquered them, the Assyrians conquered them, the Persians conquered them. If you go back to your map that had the kingdom of Edom on it, at the opposite end of the map on the north edge, you will see a, a designation for the where the Assyrian Empire started, and uh, as far as geography is concerned. And so the Assyrians came in and uh, conquered uh, a lot of, of that area. And they were uh, violent in their overthrow. But um, this message from Nahum is, that the Syrians will suffer for their brutality. And while he is um, warning about the Assyrians, he also warns the Hebrews that a similar judgment will fall on them if they do not pursue righteousness. Nahum 1 says, look there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. So we have this sense of God's judgment and the sense of His restoration. We come now to Habakkuk. And uh, Habakkuk is grieved by the wickedness of his people, but he's also distraught about the idea that they're going to be overthrown by the Babylonians. And this book is written, in uh, a lot of it, in a dialogue between God and the prophet Habakkuk. And it, it is meant to represent, Habakkuk is meant to represent the voice of those who are um, believers who are godly in Judah and struggling to, to understand, to really comprehend the ways of God. Um, Habakkuk wants to know why God seems to be silent. Habakkuk 1.13, why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? The Babylonians are overthrowing them. We may be wicked, but they're a lot more wicked than us. Where are you, God? And he is told in Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. Next we have Zephaniah. And Zephaniah's main theme is the coming of the day of the Lord, when God will punish the nations, including the apostate Judah, but uh, the end makes it clear that God will be merciful to his people. There will be restoration. So back again, we have God's judgment and we also have God's mercy. Zephaniah three twenty says, at that time I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth where I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. They've had so much loss, and God is promising them, as He promised and took care of Job, that they will be restored. Haggai and Zechariah deal with the same issue. The Jews who had been in exile uh, and 
uh, in Babylon and then in Persia. They'd been in captivity, had finally been released, and many of them moved back home. But when they moved back home, what they found was a land that had been destroyed by their, uh, by the winners of the war. And um, as they moved back home, they began to rebuild. And part of the rebuilding had to be the temple because the temple had been destroyed. But when Haggai and Zechariah are writing, uh, the work at the temple had been forsaken. I guess the people tired of it and they were busy rebuilding their community, the rebuilding homes, rebuilding government buildings, etc. They were still under uh, Persian rule at this time, but they had been allowed to come back home. Um, Haggai dealt with it directly, uh, this issue of the temple. He said, then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a, is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house, the temple of God, remains a ruin? And so the people were moved by Haggai's message and they responded by renewed efforts to restore the temple. Uh, Haggai's messages also stressed that obedience brings encouragement and the strength of God. Now, Zechariah is about the same issue, same period of time, about the time when the people were rebuilding, when they'd moved back from the Persian and Babylonian captivity. And it is primarily a book of encouragement about the future, um, the glorious future that awaits the people of God. Zechariah 8, 4 through 5 says, This is what the Lord Almighty says. Once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each of them with a cane in their hand because of their age, and the city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. Even in that day and age, as it is a consideration today, the character of a community, the character of a culture, the character of a nation, the character of a family is always measured by its treatment of the most defenseless, the very young and the very old. And this is a lovely picture here of a new day that will be coming where, the, where everyone will be prosperous and prospering in the cities of the Lord, and the old will be taken care of, and the young. And then we come to the last uh, book of the Old Testament, Malachi. And this book seems to have been written during the time of the Persian rule, when they had returned back from exile, because, uh, and because they had not yet experienced God's return to the temple with power and majesty, the people began to doubt God's faithfulness and they began to lose hope. Worship had become stale and routine and superficial and the people were no longer obedient to the law. Malachi 1, 2 says, I have loved you says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? Let me read that to you one more time. I have loved you, said the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? The main theme of Malachi is that the great king will come not only to judge his people, but also to bless and restore them. Malachi 3, on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction 
between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Repentance and reformation will lead to God's blessings. I also do not have an assignment for you for next week because I'm going to do an introduction to the books of the New Testament. And, um, and so we're not going to actually start looking at it at the scriptural references until the next week. So you've got the week off. I suggest that you use it for your private devotional times and, um, and devote yourself to time with the Lord in prayer. Let's read our closing. May thy great prayer be answered that we may all be one, close bound by love united to bring a single witness to make the pathway bright that souls which grope in darkness may find the one true light. God be with you till we meet again.